All right. Well, it looks like the broadcast has started. So um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar by MBF Bioscience. My name is TJ Tatro. I am a quality assurance person here at MBF Bioscience, pretty obviously. Um, but I'm here joined by my boss and the scientific director, Dr. Susan Tappan. Sue, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, TJ. Today we'll be using our allotted webinar time to answer some questions that you've all had relating to two of our products, Neurolucida 360 and Neurolucida Explorer. Neurolucida 360 is our, um, well, it's the program specifically designed for reconstructing neuronal processes, whereas Neurolucida Explorer is used for kind of pulling the data and extrapolating that quantitative data from the reconstructions that you've done. So as I continue, let me get this PowerPoint running. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover in the next hour, but before we get into the uh, question and answer portion of things, I want to just go over a couple of basic things about the webinar itself. As I said, it's being recorded, so it can always be viewed again at a later date. Um, if you'd like a certificate of completion after this webinar is done, please let us know, and we'll have that ready for you and available. Um, question and answers will be uh, available uh, as we kind of roll through this webinar. So there were a lot of questions that were asked during the registration period that we'll, we'll kind of start with and use as a base. Um, but please, as you come up with your questions and as things develop, um, don't hesitate to, to reach out and contact us during this webinar. So TJ, um, do you want to tell them how to um, submit those questions? Yeah. So over here on the on the screen, uh, we have just the, the submitting questions to the presenter. So it's pretty simple. You'll just want to click on the orange arrow in, in the GoToWebinar panel, find this little questions box, and then at the bottom there's going to be uh, a little form where you can submit these questions. Once you're done, you'll just click the Send button, and Sue and I will be able to view the questions that you have asked. Um, we'll be working as hard as we can to get through as many as possible. Um, we did have a lot of questions during that registration period, so we'll, as I said, we'll start with those, and then we'll kind of work our way through, and as they kind of mesh with what we're talking about on the screen, um, we'll do our best to try and address those. Um, if we don't get to your question, we're not ignoring you. Uh, there's just a lot of things that are kind of rolling in at once, so um, please don't hesitate if, if we don't get to your question. If it's still important to you after this webinar, please feel free to contact us directly, and we'll do our best to get that uh, answer to you as, as quickly as we can. Let's continue on. So before, <laughs> everything's going to be before we get started for right now, but as we continue through, um, I just wanted to point out that obviously the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, has changed day-to-day -day life for almost everyone. Um, I'm very fortunate and some other people are very fortunate to be able to access their, their workstations and their labs and just continue with the experiments and their work um, with the caveat of a little bit more precaution. But we also understand that not everybody has that luxury. Um, so our MBF technical support team is issuing COVID-19 licenses which allow product owners to work on home or on home PCs. Um, these licenses are for uh, product owners. If you don't own the product, now's a great time to reach out to us to, to get uh, a free trial. Um, those are available as well at this time. So if you have yet to contact us for your COVID-19 license, please feel free to, to reach out to our technical support team. They're currently working here as well, so we're capable of doing that for you all. Um, these licenses will be issued with a termination date at the end of this month of May. Um, and then as things progress, as regulations change and more people are allowed to return to work, um, that date may be pushed back further. Um, we're continuing to work and, and put our efforts into ensuring that everybody has the opportunity to continue with their research. Uh, a couple of helpful tips. Um, the first is that you want to make sure that if you are working at home, or on your non-regular workstation, that you to, you want to make sure that these larger files are saved locally or on a portable hard drive. Um, that's really important because as you start to work on a less powerful machine, these larger images and these larger data sets are going to become taxing on the PC itself, and so you will be um, 
you, you might notice a little bit more sluggishness within your responses to some of the actions that you're doing within the program. Uh, secondly, and more importantly, I think, uh, Neurolucida 360 cannot be accessed using a VPN or using a remote connection to your workstation. The, the user must physically be at the, the Windows PC to use the program. Um, and that's due to the graphics requirements of the application itself. So there's some hardware requirements that, that preclude the ability to use VPN as a, a viable method for um, access to the application. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, we had a few comments and questions that we received during the registration portion of things. Uh, during today's webinar, we'll address a range of topics, um, going from general capabilities all the way down to very um, specific questions about reconstruction and tips there. Um, so today we'll be focusing on um, kind of a, a variety of different things, but we've split them into a couple different categories. The first is about general capabilities of the software itself. Secondly, we'll kind of follow up that with experimental methods and the different um, procedures that you can follow and the different, um, at different ways that that's applicable to the program itself. As we continue on, we're going to be working more towards uh, specifics. So uh, two things that we want to address today are uh, Golgi images and images with dendritic spines. Um, Sue, did you have anything that you wanted to add to this, or do you want to just jump right into it? Uh, I think we should jump right in. Uh, I really encourage everybody to start submitting your questions. I'm going to try to be the MC and help um, uh, bring your questions that you're submitting now and at the time of registration into the discussion. And TJ um, at the office is going to be um, able to demonstrate the use of the software uh, live while we're talking. So we'll we'll play a little tag team here. So go ahead and start submitting your questions. One of the first things that we can do, TJ, is if why don't we go over some basic functionality of Neurolusta 360. Um, yeah, that works for me. Um, so let's bring up, you should still be able to see this on my screen. But right now we have an instance of Neurolucida 360 open with a pretty intense staining on um, this image here. So, yeah, so, um, so, uh, yeah, so this cell, let me, let me say a little bit about this cell just so that we have a little bit of background here. So this cell is um, a cortical neuron that had been recorded from uh, using electrophysiolo electrophysiology techniques. Um, and then after the conclusion of the EFIS experiment, they injected um, dextran into the cell so that you could identify the morphology. So this allows you to do structure function modeling by being able to relate the physiological responses to the morphometric um, uh, features of the cell itself. There are two um, volumes, image volumes, that were stitched together in Neurolusta 360, and that's what you see today in the, in the 3D volume. And so in the 3D window, you can see that it's an immersive environment, so you have this ability now that you're working with image stacks, you have a lot of flexibility, so you can change the view, you can zoom in and out. And this is a big difference from Neurolucida, where you're using your microscope optics um, to guide your reconstruction of what you see um, through the through the microscope optics and the live camera view. And so you're limited to the perspective that's present on on the microscope. Once you acquire an image volume though, now you have this capability of loading in the, the image stack. Um, oh, TJ is demonstrating. So the, the, the view that uh, he's showing in the main window shows how it would look on the microscope itself. And so you're seeing a top-down progression through the tissue thickness. And once you've acquired that volume, you can load it into the 3D environment, which allows you to have a lot of flexibility. In addition to that flexibility of view, you now have all of the algorithms that are present in Neurolusta 360 to make the reconstruction of the cellular features faster and easier. Mm -hmm. So you can um, 
take it away, TJ. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you pointed that out because I definitely had forgotten to mention that. Um, so as you mentioned, in Neurolucida 360, we do have capabilities to do um, automatic and semi-automatic reconstruction of, of processes. So first, I'm going to start off by just detecting the soma here. Um, there's two different ways we could look at detect all, or with my mouse now, I can just click in this 3D view and have the soma automatically reconstructed for me. Um, because this is a pretty simple image as far as like multiplicity of cells, because there's only one soma, it's definitely recommended to just use the, the click to detect. Um, when you have multiple somas, this detect all somas is much more efficient and much more practical. Um, from here, we can move on to reconstructing some of the trees. So we can, we can work in multiple different modes. We have a smart manual, a user guided, and an automatic. So in the user guided mode and automatic mode, we have three different methods. We have our directional kernels method. We have our Rayburst crawl method, and we have our voxel scooping method. Um, all three perform differently because they are all different algorithms. And so if I was to work in one algorithm or method and it is not successful, it's always recommended to try a different method. Um, because they work differently, you'll find different success with the different methods. Um, that's a lot of difference, but uh, hopefully the point got across. So working with this user-guided mode, it's more similarly related to a semi-automatic tracing. So on my screen right now, you'll see a, a lime green circle moving up and down the, the branch. All I'm going to do is click with my left mouse button, and as it loaded, I'm going to just move and click. And as I continue to click, the program is going to do a quick measurement of the diameter. And that's what these green circles on the screen are. It's, it's creating a nice, um, uh, what would you consider that, Sue? Just like a, a basis for how we're going to create this reconstruction. Um, the program does a quick measurement. And then as I click again, the, the program will follow through and do a more uh, heavily calculated measurement of the diameter. So we're getting proper measurements all, all throughout the image. Yeah, so in user-guided mode, the algorithms are uh, assessing the scene based on where your mouse position is. And so it is uh, calculating the, the likelihood of, of um, appropriate connections and uh, branch uh, options on the basis of the information that you are providing. This is extraordinarily helpful for complex scenes, but it also allows um, you to have a measure of control for... Um, the types of uh, reconstruction that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to continue on, just another little quick feature we have is this pan to window center. This allows us to do an automatic move within the 3D environment based on the last click that you do with your mouse. So you'll notice that I no longer have to use my mouse and keyboard to, to pan through the image. The program will do that automatically for us. Um, do we want to jump into uh, the the large volume reconstruction mode to, to go over some of the features there? I think so. There's a few questions that are coming in that are talking about um, working from home. And so I think uh, LVR is, is something to highlight right now. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is a different instance of Neurolucida 360. This is still the same version. Um, the version that I'm working on is our 2020.1.1 the most recent version that we've released. And I'm working in the studio uh, suite. So that means I have everything unlocked and available. This large volume reconstruction mode is only available in the studio version. Um, and you'll find it under this workspace tab and at the end of this ribbon up top. Uh, by clicking on this little gear icon, we'll be able to see what image uh, I'm using. And that's based on the folder location here and the size of my um, sub-volume box that I'll be um, pulling from my main image. It, it's important to remember that the large volume reconstruction mode needs to be an image stack. Uh, the image that you're working with needs to be an image stack, and you need to have scaling embedded within the image. Um, to do that, as you drag an image into the program, if there's no scaling embedded, it will populate with the scaling window, this dialog box, where you can update the scaling by overriding the X, Y, and Z values. 
And from there, you're able to save those values to the image stack directly, so you don't have to worry about going into the file menu and, and doing it there. Um, once the volume has been saved with the scaling, um, then you can start using this large volume reconstruction mode. Firstly, I want to point out the, the macro view here. It's populating the right upper hand corner of my screen. This is the entire image volume that we're working with in uh, Neurolucida 360 now. So the best way to use this is to navigate to the location that you want to generate your subvolume from. Um, and that's just by clicking in the window. Next, you'll notice this Z meter over here. This is telling me exactly where we are in the Z position of this image stack. And I'll use my mouse wheel to push up and down to set the location that I want to, to start my subvolume generation in. So once I find the location that I want to start at, um, I'll click the top of subvolume and set. And then I'm going to scroll down until I find the bottom of my subvolume. Um, for today's demonstration, I'll just keep it very simple and keep it at 55 planes, um, or 55 images rather. And so when I click this reconstruct subvolume button, the program is going to go through at the native Z step, and it's going to take each one of those planes of information and compile it into a subvolume for us. And in just a second, we'll see that compilation of the subvolume populate into this 3D window for us as if it was its own individual image stack. So um, just to highlight some particular features about LVR, um, so because we're able to specify where the image volume is actually sitting on our machine and, and feed in only small portions of that volume into um, the uh, um, 3D space where the algorithms are working, this allows us to work with arbitrarily sized images. So it's great for an, uh, a PC that you're working with at home for images that may not have any trouble working with in your um, higher uh, powered computer at in your lab space. But it's also a, a, a strategy that's really helpful for cleared tissue like iDisco or Clarity. It's also, um, like you see here, this is a very large but sparsely labeled um, single cell that's imaged um, using Brightfield. So this is a, a DAB reaction product um, from a single filled cell that had also been electrophysiologically recorded from. And so you can see that this strategy of being able to select small subvolumes for, for use is a, a, a capacity that you can either use with um, uh, user guided tracing like TJ is, is mentioning now, but you can also utilize other um, techniques uh, in uh, Neuralusta 360 to um, effectively manage um, large image volumes. So this is the strategy that we're working with now. We are always continuing to improve our uh, um, uh, software, including the algorithmic approaches and the uh, the system hardware as well, and how we utilize it. And uh, we're very excited about uh, our pending release, which includes um, uh, very impressive improvements in terms of uh, image handling for ever larger image volumes. So we can talk about that at another date, but um, it's always an active area of research for us. Absolutely. Um, and we just got a question from Bruce. He was asking if I can count the spines on this image. So with this image, because the staining is a little bit, um, there's a little bit of Z smear, I'm going to lower the sensitivity. This is always something that I would recommend if you're working with uh, a staining that you have a little bit of smear with in this 3D window. Um, and so as you, as you work with this detector sensitivity, you can see that the the variety of spines are being um, detected uh, properly. If you have it too low, it's going to only get a par partial um, spine detection, whereas if you have it too high, you may be over-detecting some of the spines. Um, and so this is where it's really important to parameterize using the single click to detect method. And then once you find success in doing this, you can work with this feature down here. It's called the aptly named 
click image to detect all on nearest branch. Um, it does exactly what it says it does. If I was to check this off and click near this, um, I'll click on the green one because this is a little bit more properly reconstructed. There's a couple of um, varicose spots here, but as I click close to this green branch, it's going to automatically detect the spines using the settings that we've provided. Um, you'll notice that it ignores most of the red uh, dendrite spines until we get over to this section. The only reason that we have this spine detected is because of, <clears throat> excuse me, is because of this outer range setting. I apologize. I need to take a sip of water. So, um, so the the detection that is done, if you want to count spines, um, you can do that with a variety of settings. So you can have a um, a setting parameter set that allows you to make sure that each spine is, pro you know, identified. So it's it, you get an individual um, uh, surface for each of those spines, but you may not actually feel that it's appropriate to um, uh, include the volumetric um, surface area or volume of those spines. You're really interested in number. If that's the case. You can continue parameterizing until you get a value that allows you to discretize each of the spines and carry on with your day. Um, the the amount and type of metrics that Neurolucida 360 produces is is quite um, extensive, and you can choose which ones are rele relevant for your particular research question. Um, in while we're talking about spines, I think that. It's, it's a good time to talk about what types of imaging are, what you can do at the time of imaging to ensure that you're able to get a good reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important at this point to mention uh, voxel size. So that's the size of the pixel in X, Y, and Z dimensions. So the objective that you use at the time of acquisition as well as how, what the distance is between each of your image planes as you're um, doing your acquisition. You want that to be um, nice and tidy because uh, spines are small. They're at the limit of light resolution, and so you really are going to have to acquire at a, a small enough uh, Z-step so that you can see the, the, the spines themselves. So typically, we recommend um, a um, 0.25 step, uh, Z-step, and 60x or 100x for um, magnification. If you're doing bright field um, labeling, like you see here in this example, you want to make sure that you have excellent color illumination and that at the time of acquisition, you're not um, uh, uh, extending beyond the dynamic range of, of your um, camera. So you want to make sure that you're well within the dynamic range so that you see all of the gray levels that are possible within your, um, the entirety of your image. Um, those are some strategies that you can use to, to make sure that you're setting yourself up for the least amount of work when it comes to quantification. Um, so Lauren asked about the partial varicosities that are being detected here. So Lauren, one, one way that we can avoid an over-detection of the spines in these areas, the, let me take a step back, the reason that we are detecting them here is because when we're doing the spine detection, we're really looking for um, the saturation of the staining. So if I'm to hide the tracing itself, we can see that these spines are, are pretty well stained, but the, the varicose spots are also stained in, this, in a similar fashion of uh, saturation. So if we were to have done this varicosity detection first, that would remove the, the program's ability to detect another um, aspect or property um, on the same location. So if a varicosity is detected primarily, then we won't have the secondary um, spine reconstructed there as well. It's going to be like a one-to-one -one relationship of object to um, image saturation. Would, does that sound right, Sue? Yeah, basically what we're doing is we're um, identifying that those voxels are, are um, attributed to a different morphometric feature. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, therefore, the algorithms that are used for spine detection don't have those voxels available um, to ascribe to dendritic spines. So if they are morphometric um, features that are... <laughs> 
that's we we got that um yeah <laughs> uh I'll, i'm just gonna if, if they are the morphometric features that are being detected first um then it'll go there but if it's um if it's a secondary object then it'll be you know we're only going to detect one thing in one location okay. with, with those voxels at hand right. And just to answer Bruce's question, Bruce asks if this is a Golgi prep, and it and it's not. This is uh, this is an individual cell that was labeled with biocytin after ethys, and a DAB reaction to identify the um, the labeling. And so that's why there's only a single cell in this in this preparation um, because it was filled. Uh, there are questions. Uh, Paul asks about how nice this looks because it is a quite gorgeous um, material but um, but it's very low density which is exactly correct there is a single neuron labeled in this particular image volume but how well do these functions work with more dense neuronal cultures this is this is very relevant not only for Golgi um, but for in vitro preparations or even um, clarity and and other EGFP type uh, preps where you have multiple cells labeled with the same label, how do you disambiguate individual cells? And the algorithms are, have um, uh, physical um, parameters within them to ensure that the, the neuron, the branches themselves are attributed to the, the closest soma on the basis of how um, the path is, is um, reconstructed. And so in higher density um, scenarios where you have many branches and many structures, maybe TJ, it's, it's time to move over to a, a, a cleared tissue example mm -hmm. to sort of explain how we can disambiguate that. The algorithms are designed to identify those. And, and this is important for the Z step. This is an important consideration for your, your Z separation, um, as well as your lateral resolution too. So your axial and lateral resolution are really important in giving the algorithms the tools they need to be able to attribute particular voxels to um, branches of particular neurons. But the, um, the goal here is is to make sure that when you have a soma, um, multiple somas in the field, that you trace those first and then um, do the automatic tracing for the um, branches and they will um, do their best to um, stick to a biological um, likelihood of how a branch is known to traverse in tissue. This may need to be adjusted if you're working with in vitro scenarios. There was a question that was asked prior to, um, at the time of registration um, by Laura, wondering about primary cell cultures um, with GFP positive cells. And if you're working in vitro and you've got a lot of different cells growing, um, there are different uh, considerations when you're choosing your algorithm, which algorithm you choose. So directional kernels um, is an algorithm that works very well in very sparse or incomplete staining, whereas voxel scooping or Raber's crawl is actually very good for situations like TJ is demonstrating right now, where there's a lot of um, individual fibers in the in the same field of view. Um, and that's due to how the different algorithms actually um, navigate the scene. But when you're working in in vitro situations, adding um, a Z component can help the algorithms quite a bit. So even when you're working in in vitro, if you can acquire a small uh, Z stack of your, of your plate but prior to um, bringing it into Neurolucida 360 for analysis, you'll find that having just a little bit of um, depth allows the algorithms to more um, appropriately attribute the processes to individual um, somas. Likewise, in vitro, you can have um, the branch angles uh, occur in, um, differently in C2 versus in vitro. Um, and so you do have automatic, um, we do have advanced settings that allow you to manipulate the, um, the uh, branch angle 
um, acceptance criteria so that we help um, allow or prohibit, depending on the scenario, how likely a, a branch is to deviate beyond 45 degrees, for an example. So that's a setting that you can manipulate in the software and that allows you to have greater control over how um, the branches are traced by the different algorithms. Sue, do you mind if I jump in real quick? Um, we had a question from Amel. I'm so sorry if I am pronouncing your name wrong. But um, they asked if we can connect the uh, dendrites to the soma that we've reconstructed. The answer is um, yes and no. So the, the yes side of things is when we go to this post-processing feature, um, we can apply some smoothing and connections here. So if I hit this Apply Options button, we should see the connection between, um, we'll see that between the, the somas and these dendrites as they're in relation to one another. Um, but this is only applicable when we're in that post-processing feature. So during the reconstruction and during the analysis portion of things, the soma and the dendrite are not going to be connected. Um, the post-processing is more specifically for if you're looking to get uh, a screenshot or some sort of graphic from the, the data file that you've reconstructed. Um, similarly to that, we also had a question that was written in during the registration process about how to do the tracings. Um, the question was about, do I always need to trace away from the SOMA? Um, and the answer there is no. If, if you find that you have the SOMA here and it's easier to start a little further away, let's say I start in the middle of my branch, I can work my way, um, I guess in reverse, back up to the SOMA. And then as I complete my tracing, I'm going to right click. And you'll notice that it once again doesn't touch. Um, we can edit this image and go to points. And we can just pull this point up to get it as close and as accurate as possible for our quantification a little bit later. But you'll also notice that I'm allowed to set points as origins. So if you are working at a point that's not the closest to the SOMA, if you're not working at the true origin point, we can always reclassify that at a later point. Um, so in this instance, I would just say that this is the new origin by clicking on this origin point. And then I'll click set point as origin. Um, and so now, when we look through the quantitative results in Neurolucida Explorer, we'll see that this, this branch will, will show the data accurately. It's not going to say that this is the most terminal point. It will now understand that um, this bottom point is the terminal. Um, so to answer that question, you don't always have to trace away from the SOMA. You can work in whichever whichever way you works best for you. Um, but it's just important to know that if you are working in a way that's different than SOMA to terminal, that you um, go back and you edit the, the points so that it, it shows that properly within the quantitative results. Uh, Julia asks, what's the best, most accurate way to measure SOMA size, um, automatic or manual reconstruction? Uh, I think automatic reconstruction is um, not only faster, but it's more accurate. You can adjust the sensitivity um, to, to fit the um, full 3D surface of the SOMA based on the labeling technique that you're using. Um, and it allows you to get not just um, uh, the, the widest point of the SOMA, but it also uh, reconstructs the entire SOMA. So you get this, the surface area, the volume, the you know, 3D point. If you are taking this um, reconstruction to Neuron, um, we recently got a request um, to make that even easier. We're working on that now. So, um, I'm hopeful that that will be ready very shortly. But uh, when you take uh, th uh, reconstructions to neuron for electrotonic modeling, um, it, uh, neuron requires an older um, manual uh, cell body um, identity, a single contour. 
And so if you do use 3D SOMA reconstruction, so you get the, the full rapid um, SOMA reconstruction that TJ is demonstrating, um, if you just select a single contour and set that to cell body, you'll be able to take that to neuron for electrotonic modeling. We're going to automate that so that's not something that you have to do. And if you need to make any adjustments to how the SOMA detection works, using the size constraint, you can um, limit how far down the apical dendrite the soma grows. And so you can make the soma detection reflect what you consider the appropriate size and shape of that soma to be. OK. Um, let's see. So along, along those lines, when we're talking about the interactive search region and the size constraint, those are typically the two things that we point to the most when a SOMA isn't getting properly reconstructed. If you get the message that there's no SOMA available or, or no SOMA is detected, um, usually the sensitivity is pretty fine at, at 50. The reason that you'd want to bring it up is if you have uh, more punctate staining or if it's very dim. But typically what we find is that with the size constraint, it's either, um, it, it's usually it's just much too large. Um, for when you're working with um, smaller voxel sizes. So as you get a higher magnification and a lower z-step, changing the size constraint can be very helpful to get the full encompassing volume of that SOMA, as Sue mentioned. Um, Sue, we have about 20 minutes left. Did we want to move on towards Golgi? All righty. Let's see if I can get there. There we go. So. Um, I was showing the second part first, my apologies. So in just a second, you'll see the original um, Golgi image stack that was acquired. Um, and one of the questions that we had was, is there any different or special instructions for Golgi Cox images versus fluorescence? Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but when you're working in Golgi images, typically because of this um, smear in the z-axis that the stain causes, um, Usually you can lower the sensitivity to, rather than keeping it at 50, you can lower it to 40 um, for SOMA detection. And if you're doing a spine detection or if you're doing the automatic trace settings, um, that can be lowered a little bit as well. Because this stain uh, is so prominent, it's going to be picked up by the algorithms as uh, a property of the, the dendrite or the cell body or the spine itself. So those more dense pixels or voxels in this 3D volume, because the, the staining is a little bit more intense, we can lower the, the sensitivity and that should balance it out pretty well. Similarly, but a little bit more complex, we have um, batch filters that we can run images through. And so one question that we had during the registration period was about knowing what filter to use when. Um, they're pretty... Not that they're pretty straightforward, but some need a little bit more explaining than others do. So just to jump into this very quickly, um, if we go to this filter type, we do have a Golgi filter, which would be used for uh, Golgi images. In vivo filter is used to kind of minimize the movement that we get when we're imaging uh, in vivo. The closing filter is helpful for when you have a stain that doesn't necessarily... Um, bind very well and, and keep a nice uh, solid structure, I guess. If, if you have hollow structures within the image stack itself, is that how you would describe it, Sue? It, it works to kind of fill in as best it can the, from the edges of the staining? Yes. Yeah. So if you've got very large um, cells, so you've imaged them at a high magnification and you're, you, you're using a, um, a membrane stain, uh, Di-I is a good example where it binds very tightly to the membrane, but you know the cytosol isn't um, uh, labeled as well. The closing filter is is a good option. Wonderful. The last two we have are projection. So if you need to put the uh, a bunch of images in a maximum or minimum projection, that's available. And lastly is the vessel filter, um, which is used for vasculature. But if it, more importantly, when you're working with that vessel filter, it's going to create a more harsh edge of the vessel. So once again, if the staining is a, is a little more punctate or if you don't have 
a solid um, wall around the vasculature, which can also be used in, in dendrites and, and other non-vessel images. Um, so just to save a little bit of time, rather than running through the entire uh, process of filtering the image, we have done that already. And um, I'll switch that over in just a second. So right now in the 3D window, we're looking at the original, and we can see a, a good amount of Zeebler um, closer to the center of the image and around some of these uh, dendritic spines. So as I take off the original image using our image organizer tool, the next one in line with this little eyeball here is the filtered image. And so when we run it through the Golgi filter, it really blasts at that uh, blur in the z-axis to try and minimize any of the, 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 the staining that might get picked up during the automatic or even manual detections of processes like these spines over here. So I'll quickly go through and just trace using this user guided mode once more from the top. And as I go, I'll quickly go through and we'll just create a small segment. I apologize that it's in pink. That's not really the best color to see here. So I'll change it to a yellow so it stands out a little bit more. And then we can go through and start doing some spine detections right here on this image. Um, these will also be a little more visible. Hopefully it doesn't choose purple as the first, which it did. Um, but that's okay, because we can go into edit, and we can change the color manually if we need to. Um, yeah, and so we can continue on doing this. Um, one thing that I mentioned prior is that we might want to lower the sensitivity. When we get to areas like this, um, where things are a little bit more complex in the XY perspective, it's always helpful to do a small rotation of the image just to see um, where the processes are and kind of what is visible and applicable to the branch that you're working on at that time. And so there's only three spines here right now, but this is I think this is a good opportunity to show the, the classification schemes that we've, we've come up with. Um, they're based on a paper that was uh, scientifically published a few years ago. But essentially, we're using these ratios in Neurolucida 360 based on the, um, the points within the dendritic or within the spine themselves. And so when I hit return, we have the four uh, main categories or classifications. All I need to do is click classify all, and the program will automatically bin the spines into their um, proper classifications. So we can see that from this image, we have two mushroom spines and one thin spine at the bottom. Um, as we continue on, we can go into a little bit more detail about the spines. We, we do have a larger image that we can show. Um, that's not this one. We'll show this one. So this is a... Sue, this is the human cortical pyramidal cell? Uh, yes, this is a, a cell uh, provided by Javier de Philippe's lab. Um, and it's just a, a stunning cell because you can see how large that particular cell is and, um, and how the realities of labeling tissue means that you often have areas where um, the stain or the label is brighter in some areas and more dim in others. And so this really does represent a, a typical scenario um, that uh, a lot of experimentalists are dealing with. But it's just a stunning image. So um, it's pretty. Um. Yeah, this is absolutely gorgeous, and you can see the detail of each individual spine really well. Um, before I jump into that, there was a quick question about file formats. Um, the, <laughs> the program, Neurolucida 360, is capable of reading uh, a number of different file formats. So if I go to Open and Image Stack, we can see that the, the program works with a lot of the, the confocal imaging uh, microscopes as well as other microscopes. So um, just from the list, we, we work with Zeiss, Nikon, Leica, uh, DICOM files. There's, there's a number. And then all the way down to Olympus and some scanner files as well, um, scanners. Um, 
And then typically if you're working in uh, some sort of um, deconvolution software, freeware, we can read most of those formats as well. So it's, it's very easy to run some sort of deconvolution and then bring it into our program as well. So thank you for, for asking that. Um, with this image, because of how complex it is, uh, I, I'm not going to do the, the full branch or tracing. I'm just going to work on this little segment here just to give another example of how the, the different algorithm uh, works. So when we have the two separate branches here, um, I'm going to go into spines once more and use these default settings to just pick out um, a couple spines and make sure that my parameters are correct. And then, well, I guess I'll skip that step and just go right into detecting on the nearest branch, um, which looks it looks like it did fairly well. Um, this one is partially detected because it's uh, outside of this outer range. Um, but for the most part, we did fairly well. It's important to remember that when you are doing um, any sort of spine detection or reconstruction, that you have the branch traced as accurately as possible. All of these spines are being based off of our branch tracing. So it's really important to get the, the proper, um, I would say the proper diameter and location of the points along your branch to ensure that you have the most accurate representation of your spines and therefore you have the most accurate representation of the data when we get to Neurolucida Explorer. Uh, I'll do one more click of the classification just to see that we do have a range of different spine types here. And I think with the next 12-ish minutes, I think now is a great time to segue into Neurolucida Explorer and talk about some of the analyses that we can provide, um, looking more specifically at this image as a whole. And then hopefully we can wrap up from there and answer any questions that um, we might be able to just kind of rapid fire off before we, before we conclude. Does that sound all right to you, Sue? Absolutely. I've been trying to answer um, questions directly um, as you've been demonstrating. Uh, oh, wonderful. So hopefully those are um, accessible to um, everybody. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's see what you obtain in Neurolucida Explorer because that's a key strength of the software is that after you've um, put forth the effort to, to create a beautiful reconstruction like this, the quantitative metrics that Neurolucida Explorer um, provides for you automatically, we've already computed all of this for you, um, makes it easier and quicker for you to get right to um, the ability to make some statements about um, the experiment that you've had underway. So, so as you guys can all see, um, this is not the file that I, well, it's the same image, but it's not the exact file. I only worked on this small section, but we can see that there are um, thousands of spines within this image. And this was uh, our coworker, our colleague, Julie, spent a lot of man hours <laughs> just finishing this. So um, thank you, Julie, for, for working on this. This is extremely beautiful, and I know this took a lot of time from you. Um, so thank you. Just to dive into one thing quickly before we look at the analyses, there's a really nice feature here, um, color by branch order, which is right on the front, um, not page, but the panel of Neurolucida uh, Explorer. And so we can navigate through the different branch orders um, in this program. So that's a nice way to just, with this up and down order, we can look and see, um, whoops. It's a little laggy, so I'm just not going to risk it. Um, whew. But there is, you can look through that. Um, <laughs> it, it's also going to be reported in uh, some of the analyses that we, we put forth. So granted, that wasn't visible right there, but I promise it's there. It works. Um, so next, we'll just go into the structure. We'll want to select everything using the Select All button up here. And then we'll go to structure and branch structured analysis to get some of the, the quantitative data. So I think it's nice to get a, a summary of the neuron itself. We'll obviously want to get some of the details from the spines. And then, Sue, you and I talked earlier, what did we say, tree totals? Because we could see the, the spines and the nodes as well as the, the endings and things like that. Yeah, one of, one of the really 
uh, relevant things is um, being able to see the, the spines by classification, by branch order, by density, distance along branch, all of those are computed um, automatically for you. So you can get a holistic view of the entire neuron as well as a very um, uh, specific view of a particular branch. Combining that with Shoal then also allows you to see how the um, spine densities may change as a function of distance from the soma rather than distance along the branch, which are two potentially very relevant things that can be impacted by neurologic disease like Alzheimer's, for example, or if you're studying autism spectrum disorder. It looks like my computer is really taxed with the GoToWebinar session and the, the multiple instances I have open. Um, but just, <laughs> just in uh, full transparency, we did run this before and we did generate a Microsoft Excel worksheet with all the different values uh, available for this, for the analyses that we just ran. So that was a little bit set up. Um, but we do, have the, <laughs> we do have the results right here as well. Um, so we also ran a shoal analysis on this image. Um, and Sue, do you mind just explaining that a little bit more? You have your concentric circles working the way out from the soma. Yeah, yeah. So that's how shoal works. Um, in this case, uh, the centroid of the soma is is identified, and then a 3D sphere of of your specific diameter um, and distance from the soma. That's a parameter you um, provide. And those concentric spheres emanate out from the centroid and uh, the uh, individual aspects of the dendritic and axonal arbors are, are compartmentalized within those spheres. So you can see how many spines they are. If they're categorized, you can see which spine type is, is found in which sphere um, expanding from the soma. And together with um, branch analysis and branch order analysis, this can be a very powerful way to make a, um, a statement about how things are changing uh, in your experimental design. Mm -hmm. So as Sue said, within these, the, the given radius, we chose 10 microns for this image. Um, but we can see the different amount of intersections and a plethora of other information. So because we did classify those spines um, earlier in, in a different session, um, we can see the amount of spines per 10 micron, as well as the, uh, the classification of each spine, which is really helpful. Um, similarly, we can go through and view each one of our analyses that were done. Um, and this is the exact same setup or, or viewability. I don't even know if that would be the right word. Um, but the exact same structure here is going to be the same structure that's set up in the results in NeuroLucida Explorer. So it's very easy to go from that program to get to Microsoft Excel, and then you're able to do a little bit more. You're able to average, you're able to create pivot tables and, and make nice graphics here as well. Um, and as Sue said, we can look at the, the different processes or the different analyses here and really parse out the data that we're looking for because we do provide a lot of different um, results. So if you're really only interested in one specific value of the spine. Um, let's say you only want to know the head diameter. That's available, but then we also provide you with numerous amounts of other information that maybe you didn't think were applicable until this point, and then you want to report on those as well. So NeuroLucid Explorer is an extremely powerful product that we do use. Um, one question came up as we were moving over, is NeuroLucida Explorer from Nicholas? Is NeuroLucida Explorer included in NL360, or is this a separate package? Um, it is included. When you first purchase NeuroLucida 360, it is included in that package. So you'll get NeuroLucida 360 and NeuroLucida Explorer. We also sell NeuroLucida Explorer separately. So if you needed to get another instance of that program and install it on, let's say, uh, a not workstation. Let's say you want to put it on a powerful laptop that you have because you want to do some analysis outside of your lab. That's totally okay and that's very helpful because NeuroLucida Explorer doesn't necessarily need the same um, 
processing power and computer specs as Neurolucida 360 does because we're not doing full reconstructions there. Um, so it, it is helpful to have this. I mean, you can have it on your workstation or on, a, on whatever c computer you really want to. The other aspect is, is that um, once you have a reconstruction, you can return to the model again and again and again to extract even more information from it. So having a separate application, Neuralista Explorer, allows you to um, easily uh, review the um, reconstruction and do additional analyses. So you can operate them on the same machine or you can just have them on separate machines. It's up to you. Um, it looks like we're coming down to just the last few minutes. So I'm going to quickly jump into our PowerPoint presentation once more um, and just quickly summarize what, what we've seen and hopefully we can answer a few more questions as they roll in. Um, so just a reminder for everyone that we do have the COVID-19 licenses available if you are a current owner of an MBF Bioscience product. You could own a Stereo Investigator and you want to try out Neurolucida 360. That's totally fine and we encourage that. Um, we want you guys to be able to get the most out of your time because this is a really, uh, this has never happened before for us and we want to just make sure that we're doing everything possible that uh, to just ensure that you guys are, are comfortable and, and continuing on with everything that keeps your day-to-day -day kind of normal and, and sane. Um, continue off of that. Continuing off of that, large volume reconstruction mode is a great strategy to work from home. So if you don't have the, the same capacity of work um, on your PC that your workstation does in the lab or in an office, uh, this large volume reconstruction mode is available in the studio version, which is, that's the version that you would get for this COVID-19 license or your free trial. It, building off of that, if you do not own an MBF Bioscience product, now's a great time to, to sign up for a free trial um, of Neurolucida 360 and Neurolucida Explorer. When um, you sign up for a free trial, uh, you might just get your evaluation done by uh, Mr. TJ here. Um, yours truly. The, the beauty about the evaluation process is that uh, you have TJ able, TJ and, and others in our, our company able to provide you with um, a leg up in terms of what settings are going to be helpful for you to, to start working with your free trial based on the image data that you're currently working with because you can imagine that everybody has just a wide variety. There's a huge diversity of image data, experimental preps, species, uh, labeling techniques, the, the whole gamut. And so rather than trying to have a one-size-fits-all um, method for getting you started, um, the evaluation process allows you to be starting off with specific information that will help you get going. We can also give you some feedback on how to improve uh, or, or how adjusting the imaging parameters can impact um, the, the speed at which you're able to obtain your um, reconstruction in Neurolusta 360. So we're happy to help with those components of your experimental design uh, to help you get to your answer as quickly and accurately as possible. Um, let's see. Technical support is currently available, so if you are running into any issues or if you need your COVID-19 license, they are working now, and um, they're available for any of your questions or anything that you may be running into, um, either in your lab or at home. Um, we're here to help once again. And then lastly, uh, we have an upcoming stereology webinar by our own Dr. Daniel Peruzzi. Um, he had done a question and answer session a week or two ago, and he's planning on having a second session within the within the next two weeks. So if that's something that you're interested in, please register. I'm sure we'll have an email blast go out about that. But he is an expert in stereology, and he can answer any and all questions that you might have. Um, and so lastly from us here, um, we just want to thank you for joining this question and answer session. You guys were all amazing. The questions that you had were very applicable to everything that we were doing and you know from the bottom of our hearts we want to thank you for for making this you know a successful webinar 
Um, and if you do have a question or if you want more information on Neurolucida 360, please contact us at info at mbfbioscience.com. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we're launching a forum um, that it will be accessible from the um, tech support page on our website. And so you can, you can post questions that you have um, to the forum and we can use not only our experience as developers and users of Neurolista 360, but it can also be a community where other um, NL360 experts in labs around the world can help contribute to um, best practices and um, novel ways for you to approach your experimental question. If, if you'd like to post a question there, please do. Well, thank you all again so much for attending. This was a pleasure to, to spend the afternoon, the early morning with you guys. Thanks for your time, everybody. Awesome. Thank Let's you all again. again. Have a wonderful rest of your day.